Last time, we found an equation to describe the motion of a mass on a spring and used it to figure out where our mass would go based on where it started. This analysis resulted in a nice waveform that agreed well with experiment, and we even discovered that if we plotted position versus velocity, our motion traced a circle. We left off wondering what the connection could be between circles and a mass on a spring. For each data point, we have a time, position, velocity, and acceleration. It would be nice to make sense of all this data in a single plot. Plotting four-dimensional data is a bit goofy, but let's give it a try. We'll give position, velocity, and acceleration each their own spatial dimension, and make our time dimension control the color of our points. We see a three-dimensional ring, and if we look at two dimensions at a time, we see that our position velocity and velocity acceleration plots form circles, while our position acceleration plot forms a line with a negative slope. This is because, as we showed in part one, springs push back linearly against their displacement, as quantified by Hooke's law. But why do our position velocity and velocity acceleration graphs form circles? What could a circle possibly have to do with a mass on a spring moving back and forth? And why is this video called Waffles and Harmonic Motion? Well, first of all, waffles are delicious, and secondly, circularly shaped. When an object moves in a circle, its motion is constrained in space in a very specific way. Circles seem like very natural shapes to us, but if we consider Newton's first law, which says that objects really prefer to move in straight lines, then circles are kind of a weird way to move. In fact, keeping an object moving in a circular path requires the object to be constantly accelerated towards the center of the circle. We give this acceleration a special name, centripetal. Now that we know something about the position and acceleration of objects moving in circular paths, let's compare this motion to the motion of our spring. Since our spring only moves in one spatial dimension, we would like to know how our object moving around a circle moves in one spatial dimension. Circles are, by definition, two-dimensional, so we need to project our motion down to one dimension. One way to do this physically is to cast a shadow of the object in motion. The shadow moves in one less dimension than the object does. Mathematically, we can compute projected motions using right triangles. As our object moves around the circle, for each point on the circle, we can make a large right triangle whose bottom leg is x long and whose radius is r long. Since our centripetal acceleration points straight towards our center, we can draw a second right triangle whose hypotenuse is AC long and whose bottom leg corresponds to the X component of our centripetal acceleration. Since our triangles are similar, we can see that the base legs X and AX must be proportional. We can express this in a ratio, and if we rearrange our equation, we see that our position X is proportional to some constants times minus acceleration. Remember that our spring yielded almost an identical formula, the only difference is our constants. Since constants only change the rate and scale of our motion, and not the motion itself, we found our connection. Moving in a circle requires a special relationship between position and acceleration, which is the same exact relationship that a spring imposes. These relationships govern the motion of each object, and since they're the same, the objects will follow the same paths. In the circle case, we started by assuming a motion and figured out the acceleration created by the motion. In the spring case, we assumed an acceleration and then figured out the motion. In both cases, we found the same exact relationship. Position is proportional to negative acceleration. This is the connection. Springs move like circles and circles accelerate like springs. Now that we see these concepts clearly, there is some more math we should really understand here to tie things up nicely. Depending on how thoroughly you learn trigonometry, you may already know that we have special names for the functions that result from projecting circles into a single dimension. The official names for these functions are sine and cosine. Cosine gives the x value as we move around the unit circle, and sine gives the y. In calculus, we learn that sine and cosine have some special properties when differentiated. The derivative or slope of a sine wave is a cosine, and the derivative of a cosine is negative sine. So if we differentiate sine or cosine twice, we get the minus version of what we started with. If we look back at our equation of motion for a spring, we can rewrite acceleration as the second derivative of position, yielding a differential equation. The solution to this equation must give the minus version of itself when differentiated twice, which is of course exactly what sine and cosine do. If we go back to our numerical analysis from part one, where we computed the motion of our spring step by step, 
we can compare our resulting positions to a cosine function and see that they matched the third decimal place. In our spring analysis, we assumed that our spring constant k and mass m were one, effectively eliminating them from the equation. So let's go back and add these in. Since different springs oscillate at different rates, we'll add a frequency term omega zero to our cosine solution to capture this. We'll call omega zero the natural frequency of the oscillator. When we include our constants and work things out, we see that the natural frequency of our oscillator will be equal to the root of k over m. So given the stiffness of our spring and our mass, we can compute our frequency of oscillation. Finally, our spring and mass could start moving at various speeds and positions, so our solution should take this into account. We could add a phase term inside our cosine to allow our graph to start at various points, but a simpler approach is to take advantage of the fact that we can express an arbitrary phase as the sum of sines and cosines, and write our solution as a cosine omega zero t plus b sine omega zero t. This is our general solution to our spring and mass problem. Using techniques from differential equations, we can show that this is the unique or only solution to our system. Given an initial position and velocity, we can solve for a and b to determine how our oscillator will move in specific problems. And that's it! We have found an equation that accurately describes the motion of a mass on a spring, and discovered along the way that this motion is deeply connected to circular motion. You now know how harmonic motion is connected to the best circular breakfast food there is.